All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the third day of January in the year of our Lord, 2024. Uh, I've got an important subject to speak about today, and it is it is relevant to everyone, even for non-Christians, to understand uh, this issue. <laughs> but it's specific, uh, particularly relevant for Christians, and especially right now for Roman Catholics. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about... Uh, the issue of private judgment. And I first want to go to the scriptures, as always, that's the best place to start, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting at verse 12. And of course, this is the Apostle Paul addressing the church in Corinth in general. Almost all his epistles are written to the church, the Christians in a particular city, because that's what the church was then. It was, when you look in the scripture, you find almost always the church of Corinth or the church of Rome or the church of Ephesus or the church of Jerusalem, uh, which meant the entire body of Christ, Christians that dwelt in that area, in that community. But they didn't all meet in the same place, obviously, most of the time. So you had uh, the, the, that's it, the, uh, the body of Christ in a particular city, generally. So you had one church in each city, but one church overall. Too. That's what the Scripture teaches. It, it wasn't a human organization. It was God's people, the congregation, those called out of the world unto him. So let's look here in 1 Corinthians and see what Paul tells to this troublesome church in Corinth. They had a problem with division and sectarianism. He begins just in the previous chapter with that. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, which is Satan, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, speaking of the apostles, we, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural sukakois man, a soulish man, a unregenerate man, or a Christian that's dominated, still dominated by the flesh. Um, in other words, a, a, a babe in Christ, a new believer, for example, that hasn't matured spiritually at all. The natural man does not, uh, sukakois, uh, sukakois uh, suke is soul. So the soulish man, the the Adam was, when God created Adam and breathed the breath of life into him, Adam became a living soul. Uh, Jesus said, you must be born again. So it's, uh, you must have the spirit of God in you. But the, uh, the natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Uh, they talk to an unbeliever about Christ. Uh, uh, Christ died on the cross to save you from his sin your sins, and uh, he generally will think that's foolish, it's foolishness. What does that have to do with life? What does that have to do with anything? You know, <laughs> Paul talks about that specifically in a, another place. For their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised or spiritually judged, spiritually understood. Uh, the word is ana, uh, krino. Krino is to judge. Uh, ana usually means to judge again or a, from a, or above or, or some relationship to judge. <clears throat> and here, uh, basically, in the context, it means uh, 
spiritually understood, spiritually examined. But he is who is spiritual uh, examines, appraises, judges all things. Yet he himself is uh, appraised or judged by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he should instruct him? Where is the man to tell God what to do? The world is full of them, isn't it? Uh, how many people pray telling God what to do? Yeah, as if he doesn't know what to do. <laughs> but we have the mind of Christ. So he says, who has, a, has, a, uh, who has known the mind of the Lord that that?" He should instruct him. I think that's a quotation from the Old Testament someplace, or approximately a quotation. But we have the mind of Christ. If you're born again, the Spirit of Christ is in you. You have the mind of Christ. And so we, how do we uh, uh, um, use the mind of Christ? Through faith. All things. We receive all things through faith. Now, and he goes on to say... Uh, in. Verse uh, in the beginning of the next chapter, which is not a chapter. Again, they put these chapter breaks in dumb places sometimes, just like they break the verse in dumb places. This was done years later. The guy that uh, who was that? Stephanus, uh, that created the the verse reference numbers in the New Testament. It is uh, reported or rumored that he did it while riding on the back of a horse, which explains why. They are sometimes in rather strange places. <laughs> At least that's a, that is the the report, the the tradition, the rumor. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. So we, uh, I gave you milk to drink and not solid flu food, because you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able to receive it. Because Corinth was a problem; it was a mess. And he's, they're immature. They're spiritual babes, babes in Christ. That means that they're saved, but they're, they're still living as if they're not. They're still living in the world, still thinking like the world thinks. They have not grown up. But he that is spiritual appraises or examines or judges all things, yet he himself is appraised or judged by no man. That means that once you've grown up spiritually, no man, that doesn't mean you're not appraised by God. You look to God. At that point, you should be teaching, not following teachers. I don't follow teachers anymore. I've, I've reached that point that I judge teachers. I judge Franklin Graham all the time. And what I want to talk about is spirit, uh, private judgment. Okay, let's go to a short video clip that I have queued up here. That is from um, a Catholic website called Census Fidelium, which is a bit ironic. <laughs> Let me say, this is a sermon, and it begins, I'm going to start at, at 2 minutes and 20 seconds in. It begins with a parable of the wheat and the tares, although he says cockles. Is that the old English Dawei rhymes? I don't want to look it up right now, but cockles? Cockles don't look like wheat. Tares look identical to wheat. They're grass. They look like wheat until the, the head, until the grain head appears, and that's when you can discriminate tares from wheat. Uh, he, he's misusing the parable. Uh, he's using it that, that says, well, the problem is that the, uh, the, the um, servants of the landowner Asked, should we go out and pull up the tares? And the landowner says, no, lest in pulling up the tares, you pull up the wheat also. Yeah. Now, if you, if you have any kind of a farming background, you can understand that. <laughs> if you're a city slicker, probably not. In Jesus' day, everybody would have understood it because we weren't re uh, then, we... We're not so far removed from God's creation and God's uh, ordained way of living, which is basically agricultural. Big cities are a cesspool of iniquity. <laughs> They're not the way we're supposed to live. They've always been that. Uh, 
So, but the, in the sermon here, so I'm going to listen to this sermon, and what is he, what's he talking about is the error of private judgment, which is a, a Catholic boogeyman. Um, that always criticize Protestants for the so- so-called error of private judgment. I want to talk about private judgment and how you can't avoid it. But census fidelium, what does that mean? The sense of the faithful. So not the sense of the pope, not the sense of the bishops, not the sense of the magisterium, the sense of the faithful. Properly trained, of course. So let's take a look at, at this video here and oh, a couple minutes of it. The, the, the title of it here is um, The Pitfall of Private Judgment, and it was four years ago. 8.2K views. Okay. Well, how many? 200, over a quarter million subscribers. That's pretty good for a Catholic priest, isn't it? seems clear to me that we're at the end of a mighty revolution. A mighty revolution that has plagued the world for some centuries now. The end of such disorder is usually the most difficult part to pass through as it rears up its head in its last efforts to keep alive. It fights and fights in strange and perverse ways to stay alive. I think many feel this and are at least secretly wondering if we will survive its undoing. Few seem to have the strength required to be valiant counter-revolutionaries at this time in which we need them so badly. Because of this faint-heartedness, sad to say, this revolution, which really blossomed under the Protestant breakaway, the Protestant defection from the faith, and later spread worldwide to the French Revolution. Because of this, this faint-heartedness, this revolution is all around us and even inside of us. Today, it's fitting to address one of its hallmark errors, or we could say its pitfall, one of its pitfalls, and its private judgment. Private judgment. Martin Luther, along with all the other Protestant leaders, promoted private judgment. According to them, everyone is capable of reading and interpreting the Scriptures on their own. Okay. Uh, well, let me go a little bit farther. Now. No magisterium needed. No pope, no bishops, no priests. Individual private judgment suffices. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think that is exactly what Luther said. Uh, that, is a, uh, that is a mischaracterization of the Protestant view of private judgment, and I don't even want to identify myself as a Protestant, but, you know, when, when they're right, you have to defend it. Okay. So, uh, because, again, I, I, was called, I was called out by God separate from any denomination, so... <laughs> I belong to I belong to Christ, and He doesn't allow anything else to get into there, into that relationship. Uh, it's, I'm His personal property. So, uh, if somebody else tries to stick their nose in there, no, nope, he's going to get cut off by him or by me. <laughs> anyway, there's no nobody's allowed to interfere with that. All right, so uh, private judgment, not exactly. Uh, okay, how do when I judge things, it's not simply me. It, I judge by the spirit and word of God, okay? We have the mind of Christ. We have God's written testimony. We have the words of the apostles themselves. We have the words of the Old Testament prophets themselves. And uh, this is God's spoken word. We have that revelation. And that combined for a spiritual man, as Paul says, in Second Timothy, uh, that the Scripture is sufficient for every good work, fully authoritative and sufficient for every good work for the man of God, for somebody that doesn't belong to God, no, because they don't even understand it. I didn't understand it until Christ saved me. It was only after that that I understood the Scripture and wanted to read the Scriptures. I had read it occasionally before that, but, uh, you know, sort of like a... But, I didn't know God. I didn't know Christ. 
I didn't know God. Now I do. From that moment that it was about my 21st birthday, uh, when he called me to himself, it was the, the, the light dawned. The day came. The darkness was over. Not that things have been 100% perfect since then, but that's been my fault, not his. He died on that cross to purchase a worthless wretch of a servant, I'll tell you that. All right, so private judgment. How can you avoid it? It's, it's not avoidable. It's, it, this whole idea that, uh, first of all, Francis has destroyed this. Francis has uh, destroyed that. This, this was a Catholic uh, apologetic, a Catholic polemic against everybody else, okay? That you have to have the Pope to tell you what to think, to judge for you. So you're going to let Francis judge what's right and wrong for you. Uh, let's see. This was four years ago. So things have changed in the last four years, haven't they? In lots of ways. Four years ago, we're going back to, well, this was probably prior to, uh, well, this would have been after Laudato Si, but prior to uh, uh, the uh, Amazonian Synod, was a pr prior to bringing the Pachamamas, I think, into uh, St. Peter's, prior to uh, the Pope, the Pope's announcement that he was turning Roman Catholicism into a system of earth worship, paganism. Uh, yeah, I just posted that video yesterday. It was on the uh, the connections between Francis and uh, Pierre, Pierre de, Cardin, de Chardin, the the Jesuit priest that came up with his his uh, New Age Christian Christianity. And it, yeah, I can't avoid the conclusion. I mean, it's, it's there could be other possibilities, but the thought, the, the the stream of thought in Francis, is identical to Teilhard de Chardin. The idea, the synthesis of the, his his Laudato Si, Laudato Si is completely consistent with what must be his patron saint. Just if he makes if he makes Tiard into a saint, well, don't be surprised. But uh, so Francis is living proof that personal private judgment is absolutely necessary, and it's not truly private. Uh, it, it's it's con, in con, uh, together with. The objective revolution of the uh, revelation of the scriptures and the Spirit of God, and it's not like no Protestants ever reduce it to personal judgment. It takes into account even tradition. It's willing to hear others. No, no one I've I've ever encountered really, unless they're they're very strange thinks they themselves are infallible. <laughs> Only the Pope and those who support him believe that the Pope is infallible, or anyone else other than Christ himself. And I'd like to, to add this fact, that if you search the Scriptures, the entire Roman Catholic edifice, that which makes Roman Catholicism Roman Catholicism rather than generic New Testament Christianity, is built on tradition. Which What is tradition? A whole history of private judgments. Again, private judgments aren't—nobody judges anything privately. It's it's uh, so I want to talk about private judgment and how it's unavoidable. You can't there's to say that, that you can't judge things privately is you have to. The very the very decision to <clears throat> accept the authority of the Pope above your own judgment is a private judgment, a judgment that you have to make, 
when we're confronted with things, we must make judgments. We constantly do it. And this, this applies to, to a natural man and spiritual man together. So let's go back to the, the basics of, of judgment here. So what's happening? Let, let's take uh, the, the, the Spirit of God out of it for the moment. Just go with natural man, fallen man even. So what happens? Uh, of course, sin enters into this and corrupts him. So let's, let's just say generic blank man, That's some tabula rasa. So what happens in life, we're confronted with things, and we have to make a decision. Things that aren't pre-recorded, uh, that we don't have a, a database of previous decisions. So when something confronts and we have to make a judgment, is this true or not? Uh, do I do this or do I do that? And that when we make those kind of decisions are difficult. They're, they're work. Our, our mind, our brain starts to heat up as, as it's trying to analyze. You see, on a biological level, our brains are immense neural networks. And neural networks are pattern matching things. And they, uh, they give a, a, our, so our, our brain, and this is how our memory and everything else works, is uh, information is recorded in there. It is, it is burned into the neural network. And through repetition, it becomes more and more ingrained as a pattern. So your your mind looks for patterns. Your brain looks for patterns to match, to make sense of the world around it. So you constantly have all this information coming in through our physical senses. And uh, our brain is trying to to understand that in light of past experience and past judgments. And when things come in that doesn't recognize it has to, then it passes it on to your, your rational conscious mind saying, I don't know what this is. What do you think? Uh, and that's what happens. And we build up a database in our mind, a catalog of, of habits or you could say personal tradition, a, a tradition of personal judgments that make it easier for us to live. See, if we had to constantly analyze everything rationally, we'd suffer from overload. It would, it would be a mess. So it's just like driving a car. Do you remember when you first started to, to drive a car? It was a lot of work, wasn't it? You had to consciously think about what you're doing. And then gradually those patterns, or playing a musical instrument or something like that, although I've not been able to do that very successfully, uh, you, you, you get these ingrained patterns and you don't think about it. It doesn't affect your conscious mind anymore. You're running on autopilot. You've got these neural, your neural networks are patterned. So it, as long as everything remains normal and it has uh, experience in that, neural networks are wonderful inventions from God, and, and we've learn that now we're trying to do it uh, that where it can take in general a it doesn't have to have absolute specific things like a normal computer program so it can take in general information and match that in a fuzzy way with experience and knowledge and give you a, a an indication about it so that to make sense of it without having to to do a lot of analysis and, and hard work. It becomes easy. Driving a car becomes second nature. And sometimes I'll go the, for example, pattern matching. You get used to going a certain way, for example. Uh, normally when you drive, you're going a certain direction. So I often, uh, because I often think of other things. I, I'm not uh, uh, normally that present in this world in some ways. My mind is going is going other directions, so it's I'm uh, it's, driving a car is not particularly a conscious activity most of the time, unless things don't match up to normal. And so I'll often, if I'm thinking about something else, I'll find myself going to a normal destination rather than where I might actually be going. And I used to do that when I drove a forklift years ago too. I'd I'd find myself he heading down to the wrong end of of uh, the uh, the 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 plant the General Motors plant, uh, because that's where I usually went. 
but I was actually going someplace else because I wasn't consciously thinking about doing my job. My mind was somewhere else. I'd go the wrong way. And I go, oh, what am I doing down here? I have to be back there. So that's, uh, and without that, without habits, without a, uh, a tradition of judgments, life would be very, very, very difficult for physical creatures. Animals learn the same way. I've got chicken. I've got a dog. She's she's pretty smart, but uh, I got chickens. And generally, chickens, you know, bird brains aren't considered to be terribly intelligent. But if they see me out, they know. Hey, this might mean food. Let's go down by that guy, and they think I'm a rooster. Yikes! They're not very smart. But if they see me with a container in my hand, they say, oh, no, it's chicken scratch. Let's go mob him. He's got something good for us. Uh, so they recognize patterns. The chickens, I guess, can recognize over 100 words or sounds. Not really words, but sounds. Uh, they don't have a language ability, but they do make some communication noises, and uh, they have a fair... You know, like birds in general have can communicate, uh, not not consciously like human beings. I don't know how much of human life we actually live in a conscious level uh, sometimes. But uh, again, so but your your entire you have your own personal tradition. I'm going to use that language instead of habit that this build up over time, so that life becomes easy and livable. And you're able to do complex tech tasks without having to constantly think about what you're doing. And so you can you can then function at a higher level. If you had to, conscien- like, like learning to drive, you can't go down the road listening to music or, or thinking about other things uh, and drive at a beginning level, can you? Not safely. Not safely. And as you, as your life progresses, you've got a bigger and bigger catalog, and so uh, you're able to respond uh, to a lot more material. And depends on what you fill your mind with, too. Uh, since for 47 years, my mind, God has seen my mind be programmed with Scripture, so I think biblically, uh, automatically judge things biblically. If I see something on uh, Twitter X, which is probably not a good place to be. Uh, and it, it, my mind will make an immediate judgment. But it, it's, it's Scripture-based, almost always. It's Scripture-based. And I can, I can then stop and examine it and think, okay, and, and recognize almost immediately what Scriptures that judgment is coming from. It's been, the, the Bible has been wired into my brain. So I don't have to go search the Scriptures for a subject. I just... It just comes out, and the Spirit of God interacts with that, too, uh, to bring the proper things to mind. So we, that that is not exactly, the you know, like just asserting my private will, exalting myself over God and making a judgment like that. No, that's not. Uh, and that's n- certainly not what the Reformers had in mind, either. Uh, again, the reformers would often reference Augustine improperly. <laughs> uh, they were not sola scriptura. It, it, it was just a slogan. I'm sola scriptura, but not sola as apart from God, apart from the Spirit, and not sola as in the sense that I will not listen to the opinions of others, because I'm fallible. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not the infinite God. I'm not Christ Himself. And because of that, and I recognize that that fallibility, but it, generally my my mind is reliable when it comes to to biblical issues. You know, forty seven years of experience of, of of searching the scriptures does that. Uh, and I, but I still discover things that I haven't seen before. Just the other day, I saw something that just involving the tense of a verb. Uh, something that I'd always always interpreted the way other people did. And then I look at it and say, wait a minute. But that, that's an example, too, where the, the Spirit of God is a constantly leading us into all truth. He'll bring things like that to your attention, 
And then you can look at it, and then you make a judgment, but it's based on your knowledge of God's Word and the, pre- the fact that the Holy Spirit is in you, leading you, and you, you have a, a broad knowledge of, of other people's opinions on these things. Uh, which, you know, opinions back here. This shelf up there is God's Word. That stuff there is opinion. Everything else is opinion. And that's what tradition is. It's opinion. It might be the opinion of many people over many years, but that by itself, tradition does not have uh, the same authority as Scripture. It's just, at best, a, say, a majority opinion. Now, majority is not the same as truth. This country is a democracy. How often does this country make wrong choices when it comes to presidential elections? How many times does the, the, the population actually presented with a reasonable choice these days? It's like this year. It's like, really? So, of course, who knows? Things can happen. But right now it looks like Trump versus Biden. Of course, they both could die between now and the election. Uh, but uh, Or something else. I mean, they're at that age. It would not be a surprise, uh, especially with Biden. But anybody can die at any time. Let's face it. You know. But what's the choice? You know, sometimes our our choices are well. We do. Have, we always have a choice. Even a slave has a choice. A slave always has the choice to not obey. It may be painful, but you still have that choice. We are human beings. We are not uh, autonomous. Uh, we are, we're not program machines. Uh, we do have a, a will. And because we have a will, we are morally responsible to choose what is right in the sight of God regardless of the consequences, don't we? So to to say that private, see, private uh, decisions or private judgment is something you can't avoid. Even at Roman Catholics, you can't avoid private judgment. The very judgment to, to do whatever the Pope says or whatever the priest says is itself a private judgment, is a a judgment, a decision you make, and you make repeatedly. Although each time you make it, it becomes more and more ingrained. And then if you choose to change that decision, it becomes a little difficult. It's like today, from I understood from something I heard, I think it was, well, from a Catholic uh, YouTube channel yesterday, that apparently 85% of American Catholics do not attend Mass weekly. For some, that would be a state of mortal sin. (laughs) Mortal sin is not defined, though, is it? It depends. Whatever your priest's private judgment is, because there's no defined uh, thing on that for many things, like whether attending Mass or not attending Mass is a mortal sin. Because the papacy hasn't defined it, I don't think, <laughs> specifically. But you, we, we constantly have to reappraise things, too, because the world we live in is changing. And as it changes, we have to, at times, reexamine our judgments, reappraise our judgments. It's just like my parents grew up, and they always voted Democratic until— the Vietnam War, and I think finally they voted for Richard Nixon because there were just too many people getting killed in Vietnam, and it was the country was a mess. It was between between uh, uh, the the civil rights movement, uh, which Johnson wasn't he was pro civil rights, but it was a traumatic experience for the country. Uh, it should have been handled differently. Well, the Civil War should never have happened. Christians could have done this much better. But we aren't led by Christians in this country, which means we often have to make judgments all the time. 
But the, the Pope, Francis, you got to be kidding me. To subordinate my judgment to Francis? Are you nuts? See, Catholics, you have to deal with this now. Francis has forced it upon you, forced upon you whether or not the, the, the fundamental issue here is, is the Pope infallible? Vatican I said the Pope's infallible. Can a council be fallible? And if the faith never changes and if simply stating what has always been true, then if, if Vatican I was correct, then the popes have always been infallible. Do you, have you ever read the history of the popes? This is a non-tenable doctrine. It doesn't correspond with reality. It does correspond with the sinfulness of men and the desire for power and the desire to, to lord it over others. And institutional power, grasping for power. And going back to the Tower of Babel, man's desire for security other than simply trusting God. But you can't avoid private judgments. It's impossible. We always are making private judgments, all the time. And... It, 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 again, we we our our mind tends to re rely on previous judgments, but things come along like in that case the Vietnam War and all the chaos of the chaos of the 1960s. Most people today, you know, they look at Trump's presidency and and Antifa and all this other stuff, Black Lives Matter, and and I'm thinking back, you know, like wait a minute, <laughs> well I've seen this before. Uh, Chicago, 1968, the Chicago Convention, uh, Democratic Convention under Mayor Daley. I mean, uh, you haven't seen anything yet. Uh, the the militant bombing universities, uh, the uh, the the uh, what are they? Was the National Guard uh, Center? I think it was, or the ROTC. Uh, center in the University of Wisconsin Madison, which is the premier premier uh, university in Wisconsin. I mean, that's the premier campus. They are the the top of the of the hill. They are, and it was also called the blo the dark side of the moon too in the in the nineteen eight sixties. Uh, but the, 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 somebody bombed the ROTC building. It was crazy. Kent State. The massacre at Kent State? Well, not really a massacre. It was it was more like the Boston massacre. It was it wasn't intentional, let's put it that way. It was what happens when you have inexperienced people with firearms acting as law enforcement when they're not, and confronted with a unruly group of people and uh, they begin to get afraid, and suddenly there's a, a shot or a backfire someplace, and then they all just shoot. That's what happens. They lose discipline, and they're, they're not a disciplined unit. And they uh, That's what happened to the Boston, Boston Massacre. They were being assaulted by a mob with throwing stones and chunks of ice and everything else at them, and their uh, their discipline broke down. Their officer was not able to, you know, the fear just overwhelmed them. And somebody shot, and then everybody shoots. Because you figure that when somebody shot, there was an order given, and so you're supposed to shoot too. That's the way life is. It's a lot of these police shootings too. They're they're they're. They're not intentional, generally. Not that there aren't some people that will do things like that. But, they're, they're, no, they're generally uh, accidents or things happen and you have to make a, a instantaneous decision, and sometimes those decisions are wrong. We need to recognize that. Private judgment right there. Your training, see, in their case, uh, their training kicks in, and you don't have... You know, when there's a half a second between uh, you shooting and you dying, 
You don't have time to think about the circumstances. That's why it's important to be trained properly, because you don't have. And, and they should not be judged in the same way as murder is because of that. Uh, in the performance of their duty. Now, if they do something that is malicious and obvious, uh, uh, ill intent, well, then it's different. But you have to prove that. And society needs to recognize these things. But private judgment is required of us all the time. Elections require private judgment. God requires judgment. Again, that, that scripture I looked at there, the spiritual man, the spiritually mature man judges or praises all things. We are required by God to do that, to subordinate ourselves to human institutions and with, without judging them constantly creates nothing but corruption and evil. And the, the lack of private judgment the suppression of private private judgment is itself wicked because our relationship with God is personal. It's between God and us through Christ. It is not between us and an institution. And anything that tries to insert itself between uh, especially a man, a husband, and God, because the Scripture says that the, the, the head of the wife is the husband, and the head of the husband is Christ. So anything, including a priest or a pastor uh, or any other authority, tries to insert itself in that into that relationship is to be rejected as antichrist. It's opposing Christ's rule over you. And <clears throat> you can have a tradition develop of that, and that is a problem. So Roman Catholicism, the idea that personal judgment is, see, all that is is the institution trying to protect its errors. Now, Catholics today, and this applies to everything, everybody, even if you're not a Christian, because these general principles apply. You have to make judgments. God requires it of us because we are moral creatures responsible to him for our judgments, especially those judgments that we do consciously. And we ought to be basing them on his revelation. Even, even unbelievers are judged by God because he has given them a revelation of his existence through nature. The, the fact that things, it, uh, the, everything that is created reveals that a God exists, a God and it re uh, reveals his deity and his power. Creation doesn't really reveal too much about his moral character, but it reveals his deity and his power. And there also is a certain element of what commonly is called natural law, where uh, people make judgments about what is right and wrong, even without special revelation, which is, which is Christ in particular and the scriptures, special revelation. So there is a certain knowledge of right and wrong that is given to us and also instilled by society and everything else. Uh, our conscience, and our conscience can be trained for good or for evil, but it still has a certain uh, revelation of truth that's built into it. Uh, for example, uh, but sinners, how it is revealed is, is when you condemn somebody else for the, for the very thing you do. It shows that you, because you practice, you don't practice what you preach kind of thing. So you condemn a person for stealing something from you, but you steal from other people. So you, you'll be judged by your own judgment. That's what Paul says. They are law unto themselves. They reveal that they have a knowledge of good and evil uh, that they themselves violate. All right, so... With Francis and his manifest turn away from Christianity, because that's what he's done. He's turned away from Christianity to paganism, to, uh, to a, uh, a, a green earth-worshipping agenda. That's, that's what it is. Uh, his, his, uh, apparently his 
his uh, subordinating his judgment to to uh, Pierre Thierry de Chardin and his strange views uh, has called caused Francis to turn to turn away from Christ because Char, uh, Thierry de Chardin is not a Christian at all. His ideas are anti-Christian. They oppose Christ. Uh, the, the idea that Christ did not rise physically from the grave, but rather uh, transubstantiated himself into into the universe and all matter, is is uh, utterly unchristian and pagan. It is uh, anti-Christian because it doesn't. He didn't submit himself to the Scripture. It's, he he didn't care about the Scripture. He worshipped his own ideas. Just he even says it's just my own imagination. So that that's private judgment. And it's a canard to say that Luther and and the other reformers taught private judgment because that's not true. They did not teach self will that I'm judging based on my autonomy, but rather recognize that everyone must exercise self-judgment because we are moral creatures made in the image of God. We're supposed to be the image of God. We're defective. If you're born again, much of that defect is fixed. But we still dwell in a mortal body. We still can err. So we do listen to others. We just don't subordinate ourselves to anyone but Christ and Christ and God's word. So but we do recognize that we may not understand it perfectly. But it is an absolute unchanging sta standard. And I anybody that brings up the canard of textual criticism and variance and all, that's a bunch of hooey. You don't know what you're talking about. I've examined the variants. I've I've done computer analysis on them much better than the jokers over in Munster. And I will judge them, too. So when I look at a biblical translation, I judge it automatically. And I depend on the Holy Spirit. And if there's something that's not quite right there, I'll get a, 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 a prompt to look at it. I don't hear the, a voice, but I, I have a sense that hmm, there might be something I need to look at. And not always, but most of the time, it's correct. There's something I needed to look at closer because the translators, translation is a difficult process. You make, er, translators are, translations are based on private judgment. Everything the Pope does is private judgment, and he's not, he's not a Christian. The very, you know, the idea of a human being that's not Christ. Being infallible is by itself a false anti-Christian doctrine. You have to, in order for Catholics to survive, in order for the, uh, the Catholicism at all to survive, it has to correct one point. It has to correct placing tradition on the same level as Scripture. Scripture must be above it. The Scripture must judge tradition, just as we always must judge our, our previous judgments, you know, we, we, because we, we have prejudge, uh, you know, that database functions as a system of prejudgment, prejudice. We are prejudicial among certain uh, on certain things because of past experience. When new information comes in, especially that seems is contrary to that, we need to correct that, renew our minds, and that requires God's help too. But it's you know it, it's like, like I said, it's a canard. The, the the idea that they promote as private judgment is just a bunch of hooey. Uh, that is just slanderous. That is not true at all. It's not true. It's just a way to maintain the authority of the system. 
The Roman Catholic, uh, Catholic hierarchy is not based at all on Scripture. There is no foundation at all for the papacy in Scripture. The keys were given to the apostles alone. There is no basis for claiming that that authority passed on to others. That's what you have in the apostolic and Pentecostal movement, claiming, people claiming to be apostles and prophets, and they're not. The authority to establish doctrine only was given to the apostles. And even to them, if you read the text in the original language, it says that you shall, what you shall bind shall already have been bound in heaven. So the apostles are functioning as the ministers of God in that capacity where what is given to them to bind or to loose has already been bound or loosed in heaven by Jesus Christ. But that, uh, that is not passed on to the so-called bishops. Because they, the, that's the, that is the apostolic office of laying the foundation of the church, which is the apostles and the Old Testament prophets in reference to Christ, with Christ as the, as the chief cornerstone. It's all reference to him. The, pap the, popacy, uh, the, the popacy, the 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 papacy, the papacy is not there. No Christian can establish new doctrines. The foundation was laid by the apostles. It cannot be altered. We are warned to be careful how we build upon that foundation. With silver and gold and precious gems, not with wood and straw and stubble. Because it's going to be tested, tested by fire. Some of it will not endure the flames. The flames, that's God's judgment. He will judge it. Everything that's not consistent with him, not his workmanship, will be burned. Thank God for that. Otherwise, heaven is going to be filled with trash. Francis is forcing you to make so-called private judgment. Vigano is off is exercising private judgment, is he not? Schneider and some of the others, they are they are not submitting themselves to Pope Francis. They are not subordinating themselves to Pope Francis. They are opposing him. Now, like uh, Strickland. He submitted to the authority as far as, okay, he's deprived me of my office. Okay, fine. But he's not submitting his mind to Francis. He's submitting to the authority of the papacy and that's the, because he holds his office as archbishop in, what is it, Houston or something? Tyler. Tyler, Texas, driven by there many times. It's, it's near Dallas. It's between, uh, it's east of Dallas, by the way. Uh, yeah, so he's, uh, like the apostles in the, in, the, in the New Testament, when the authorities, when the Jewish authorities forbid them to preach Christ crucified, they, they said, well, <laughs> no. They submitted themselves to punishment but they did not obey. They refused to obey that order. Whether it's right to obey you rather than God, you judge. But as for us, we cannot help but do what we uh, proclaim what we've seen. So they were they continued to preach Christ and Christ uh, crucified and Christ risen from the dead, regardless of what the authorities did. But they did not resist the authorities as far as trying to overthrow the authorities or rise up against them. They, they simply endured the punishment and continued their, their mission, committing themselves into the hands of our Lord. 
So you, you, you have to make judgments about Francis, for example. Now, Francis is a, is a sneaky, clever snake, uh, serpent, dragon. Because it's it's like this last pronouncement. Let's see if I can look that up quick. What was the name of that? The the blessing of the irregular couples and gays. Uh, Fiducia Supplicans, published the 18th of December last year, apparently. Yeah, it's, but that is not a, uh, what do you call it, apostolic, uh, what was uh, Laudato Si? I forgot. Apostolic Epistle. It was not Francis personally teaching from the, the seat of Peter. And from my reading of, of Vatican I, as long as he's um, exercising his office as universal bishop and teacher, everything he says is infallible. You going to go with that? You going to go with uh, Francis's Laudato Si? Really? You're, you're, you're going to become a green, earth-worshipping socialist? You're going to follow Antichrist? Because he is Antichrist. He is an Antichrist. There's many Antichrists. He's one of them. The office itself is Antichrist because it substitutes itself for Christ. Antichristos. Anti means both against and instead of. Vicar of Christ means instead of Christ, a substitute for Christ. So Antichristos is a substitute for Christ. Someone who subs himself, substitutes himself for the place of Christ. That's what the vicar of Christ is, right? Vicarius Christi? The substitute for Christ? So at the head of Roman Catholicism, you've got this guy that claims to be take the seat of Christ and substitutes for him. So he offers his personal personal judgments in place of the mind of Christ and the Word of God. So you why why do you want to follow Antichrist? Because the church has told you this over and over again. You're afraid not to. You're afraid that you'll be in a state of mortal sin. Because to be a Catholic is to it, traditionally is to be in communion with the Pope. Well, now you've got a, a pope that you cannot be in communion with and be in communion with Christ. You've got an antichrist for the pope. You've got a judge. Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to follow the word of God? Are you going to follow the teachings of the apostles? Or are you going to follow Francis? That's your choice. You can't avoid private judgment. Your choice should be informed. By, especially by the Word of God, by the Scriptures. It can't be informed simply by tradition, because the papacy is built on tradition, and tradition, the authority of tradition, depends on the papacy. It's a structure that is not founded on the foundation of the Church, on the apostles and the prophets, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. It's built on a different foundation, the foundation of tradition, of human judgments that are apart from what God has revealed. The papacy itself, the, the uh, apostolic succession, the, the authority of the keys going beyond the apostles, that is nothing but tradition. It has no foundation in Scripture. It is not a revealed doctrine. It is an invented doctrine. You're going to have to judge these things. You have no choice. To not judge is to judge. There is no possibility of not judging. Can't do it. 
The very fact that you refuse to judge is itself a judgment, a decision you make. And Francis is going to force Roman Catholicism, Catholics. You will have to judge what is your authority. If it's not Francis, what are you going to take as your authority? Are you going to go back to the foundation of the church, the scriptures, the, the, uh, the doctrines of the apostles, and the relevant Old Testament uh, prophets when they spoke of Christ? And Christ being the chief cornerstone, the reference point for all things. Everything that's built off is built off him. He provides the, 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 the reference point for the construction of the temple of God. If, you, if you've ever built anything, building, you know you have, you have a corner mark and everything is off that. All the dimensions are taken from that one reference point or you'll get accumulated error. And that's what Rome has, accumulated error for not referencing off Christ, not building straight on that foundation, but has built on a lot of, a lot of it. Tradition is built on sand. And tradition changes because it is not the unchangeable word of God. It is not built on Christ. So the church can say it doesn't change, and it say, that, yes, the spiritual church does not change. But Roman Catholicism is the visible church, or a portion of the visible church. That does change. It's like saying our, our bodies don't change. Well, they certainly do. You're going to have to make these judgments. What are you going to do? You going to go with are you going to go with Francis? Now his his uh, fiducia supplicans was a a sneaky snake like doctrine because it is not an encyclical. Yeah, there it comes. I finally remembered that encyclical. It is not official teaching by the Pope from the seat of Peter universal teaching, whereas Laudato Si is obviously intended as that, not just for even the or Catholics, for the entire world. <clears throat> as a universal bishop, he claims authority over everybody. That's why it's my business, too. Plus, I, I do belong to Christ. I am part of the church. Everything that affects the body of Christ affects me. I have an interest in what the Pope does, because he's teaching against Christ. And I'm part of the church. So you have to choose. You don't have a choice. Even, even going with Francis is a choice. And it, it, the and it has to go beyond Francis. Because in order to reject Francis, you have to reject the authority of the papacy. And the authority of the papacy is based on tradition, not scripture. So you have to reject the authority, the absolute authority of the e the equality of tradition with scripture. What you have to do, logically, you have to do this. You have to go back and recognize that scripture is above tradition. And Scripture judges tradition, or Scripture must tradition must be judged by Scripture, by the infallible, unchanging, special revelation of God. Completely rational decision. You must make it. Otherwise, you will go with Antichrist. And you've been programmed to be afraid of making decisions that you now must make. Recognize that. You have a fear. You have a fear that, that if you oppose Francis, you will go to hell. You will not. To do what is right in the sight of God is never a sin. To trust in God's word is never a sin. To go back to the teaching of the apostles and Christ 
and the Old Testament prophets that speak of, of Christ is never a sin. But you've been programmed by an institution that sought to enslave you to itself. And who was behind that? Well, the same one who's behind Francis, the devil. The devil uses these things, human things, human traditions, to, for his own purposes. They seem right in the sight of man. But as in the Proverbs it says, there's a way that seems right to man, but its end is death. The papacy is an example of this. Oh, yeah, it, it seems to make sense on paper. But what does it do in reality? Because it overlooks the problem of sin and human corruption. And the kind of people that would want to be in those positions are not spiritually mature Christians anyway, because we do not want to lord it over others. Jesus told us not to. He said, among you, it shall not be so. The very idea of controlling other people's lives is just anathema to us. We don't want to do that. Because Christ set us for freedom. Christ set us free. We, we need to be responsible individually to him. We must be in that personal relationship with him. We must love him enough to do what is right in his sight, even if it is not to our personal advantage, especially in the short term. It's always to our advantage in the long term. And that's where you find yourself today, because Francis has forced it upon you. The devil has overplayed his hand. He knows his time is short, so he's overplaying his hand a lot. And again, this uh, fiducia supplicans, Francis made sure it was done in such a way that it is not from the seat of Peter. It is from the, uh, the uh, dicastery. They didn't want to say the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith anymore, do they? Much, much less Inquisition. Uh, so that just shows you something about Francis. He wants to downplay doctrine. He wants to downplay the, the teaching that, that the church has always had. Now, going back to the, the, the teaching of the apostles, especially in the New Testament, especially the epistles, because it's, it's post, uh, it's after the cross, and it is uh, after Pentecost. And why I'm focusing on, on the writings of the, the apostles and the epistles is because what Christ preaches in the gospel, a lot of it is law. A lot of it is the law of Moses, and we're not under the law of Moses as Christians. We're under Christ. It's Christ in us that he is our law. We have this, we're, it's, it's written on our hearts. It is, it is out of love for him that we act. And his law, his law is love one another, love for Christians to love Christians, to love the brethren as the, the way John interprets it then. So you, it's just a, there's a certain issue that comes up in the Gospels, and you have to discern, is he talking about things that will be true after the cross, or is he restoring the law of Moses, because that was still in force in that day, and the law of Moses convicts people of sin, whereas the Pharisees had watered it down so it no longer served that purpose. So he's restoring that because that shows people they're sinners and need a Savior. So you have to be able to understand that that causes some confusion there for many people, as it did for me. It did for me, too. Uh, so, so, I'm, so how do the apostles interpret what Jesus said? And again, they have the, the apostles were given the authority to, to uh, establish doctrine, but they didn't invent that. It was already established in Christ, and they simply revealed it. But it doesn't go beyond that. How can you? There's one foundation. The faith was delivered once for all to the saints. So anything that comes after that is simply tradition at best. And that anything that comes after that has to be judged by that which was delivered by the apostles. That is 
the, the doctrine of the entire church. Anything that is sectarian, anything that is not universally held by all Christians everywhere is not the doctrine of the faith. It's not de fide. Orthodoxy has never recognized the authority of the Pope, the, the authority claimed by the Pope. Never. For a thousand years. They certainly weren't going to recognize Vatican I. So you've got a, 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 a section of the church going off in its own direction, establishing its own doctrine with no foundation in Scripture. Well, why didn't they recognize the authority of the Pope? as established by Vatican I, because they knew it wasn't scriptural. It wasn't part of the faith delivered once for all the saints. It wasn't part of the faith delivered to them. Not that they don't have a lot of their own stuff. You have to make a judgment, and you have to make the right judgment. You're forced to. Before God, you're required to. You're required personally to make a decision what are you going to follow? Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to follow this, the, the doctrines of the apostles? Or are you going to follow Rome? Are you going to follow Francis? You can't do anything else. Are you going to follow Francis to hell? Because that's where he is going. Because he does not believe in Christianity. He does not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. He worships the earth and wants you to worship the earth. And that's where you are. A choice between a pagan pope and Jesus Christ. That should not be a difficult choice at all. But you'll have to make that decision, whether you like it or not. <laughs>